I'd like the mining panel participants to please come to the dais. We have a wonderful presentation uh, for mining and uh, natural resource development. We have the uh, World Bank staffer for the ministry, Mubin Shah, who is at the center of a lot of the action on the ground in tendering. We have captain in the United States Navy, which is a big rank of uh, Captain Bischoff from the DOD Task Force on Business Stability Operations. We have uh, Mr. Gulistani on behalf of the Marble Center of Excellence, uh, a Department of Commerce promoted program, U.S. Department of Commerce promoted program. And uh, have I missed anybody? And Saeed Mirzad, who is, uh, has been with the United States Geological Survey's Afghan program, uh, helped to design it at the very beginning, is on top of it, has some really interesting news for us today. So uh, make your way to your seats. Is the Canadian ambassador, the uh, Canadian ambassador here, the new ambassador to uh, Afghanistan? I wanted her to say a few words uh, to the group, and I don't see her. I hope she's coming back. All right. Uh, everybody is making their way to their seats, and I will pass the program over. To uh, those of you standing talking in the back, could you please uh, take your seats? Okay. Okay, with, without further ado, uh, I will introduce Michael Hydry. Uh, many of you know him. He was a major figure. Uh, in the advisory capacity uh, to the Minister of Mines during the INAC uh, years, the INAC tender years. Um, he uh, is presently working uh, as the country director, chief of party for uh, the USAID MIDAS program. He is a longtime specialist in this field and he will be your moderator. Take it away, Mike. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Don. Good afternoon. Did everyone have a good lunch? I know it's kind of hard to come back after in the afternoon, but I'll try to keep you going. Uh, welcome, everyone. I want to recognize again uh, from Afghanistan our esteemed uh, Deputy Minister of Mines and uh, Minister of Mines and Petroleum, uh, Mr. Abdul uh, Jamil Harris, and thank you for your keynote speech. We are glad that he was able to be with us. And uh, dear guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, wake, welcome. I want to thank you for your presentation today, that you came here today. خیلی خوش وقتم که اینجا هستم و برنامه‌ای که من می‌خوام صحبت بکنم راجع به توسعه سکتور معادن در افغانستان و مخصوصاً پروژه USAID راجع به توسعه و انکشاف معادن در افغانستان که اسمش مایداس هست. Uh, I'm going to have a brief presentation. I want to leave enough time for all my esteemed colleagues. We have a distinguished panel here. Uh, and uh, I want to give them enough time, but basically, briefly, I want to tell you about USAID program, MIDAS, which is Mining Investment and Development for Afghan Sustainability. Uh, this is a project that is run by my company called ECC, Environmental Chemical Corporation. I have to mention that because my vice president, Rick Abel, is here, and I would be in trouble if I hadn't mentioned that. So uh, welcome, Rick. He just arrived from Denver, or wherever you were. Uh, and uh, so 
MIDAS, USAID MIDAS is a major undertaking by USAID. Uh, it's a four-year program. We are going to look at various uh, aspects of uh, mining in Afghanistan. Uh, it, the objective is to develop the mining sector capacity development for the Ministry of Mines and Petroleum, which includes also Afghanistan Geological Survey. Uh, we are going to work on the, uh, the legal aspect of le legislative and regulatory reform is our first component, working with the mining laws and the mining regulations and negotiation skills. Uh, the second component is related to capacity development for the Ministry of Mines and AGS. And the third component is related to uh, strengthening the private sector, working with the communities, NGOs, civil societies. And also, we have a number of cross-cutting issues that are important. Of course, gender issues, making sure that women are women participate in mining and also benefit from the uh, mining or future mining operations where the communities are. Uh, and there are other cross-cutting objectives as you can see in the slides. Uh, I'm not gonna read through everything. I wanna leave enough time for my colleagues. Next. So under component one, uh, as you know, the uh, mining law is being considered right now by the parliament, was approved by the cabinet earlier this year, and we are working with the Ministry of Mines and Parliament to explain the benefits of, of the mining law in terms of why it would be beneficial for the country in terms of attracting investment to pass the new mining law. I'll talk about it just uh, a bit further. Next, please. In terms of the uh, capacity development, we uh, have mineral exploration uh, capacity development at Ministry and also, also AGS. What we are going to be doing is to assist the Ministry of Mines and Petroleum to develop mining projects so that they can be tendered and uh, to attract companies both for exploration and further on for mining e exploitation. The next, then as, uh, then as part of our program, we have a unbudget financing. This is something kind of new, USAID in these kind of projects in Afghanistan, that USAID will uh, basically have $45 million budget directly to the Minister of Mines uh, under MIDAS, we will be assisting the Ministry of Mine for the procurement, for the uh, expenditure, and for selection of the uh, contractors, of course, in line with both USAID and uh, Afghan uh, uh, procurement laws, ARDS and other agencies working with the Ministry of Finance. And uh, now, uh, most of these funds will be used as for exploration for uh, drilling because as you know Afghanistan is a very rich country but still a lot of exploration needs to be done to define further better the mineral deposits uh, to to their credit uh, Scott is going to talk about on task force we're going to talk about what task force has done what they have put together so far is all those projects that uh, enough data were in, uh, available for them, we need to do more drilling to define new projects. And that would be our work over the next three years. Next. And then, as I said, uh, the private sector strengthening is part of our, is part of our program and working with the communities and uh, small, medium enterprises and uh, capacity building for local institutions, uh, as well as access to finance that other speakers have talked about. Next, please. And I just wanted to mention just a list of challenges that 
you have seen other speakers refer to uh, uncertainties about security, about elections, uh, mining law, of course, the unbudget USAID uh, procedures, uh, and some other that you can see in the, in, in the list. Next. A lot of people have asked me about the mining law, so I just wanted to give a brief uh, summary of what's happening. As I said, it was passed by the, it was approved by the cabinet earlier this year. Currently, it's being reviewed in the parliament. Uh, final content is uncertain. Uh, we are assisting the Ministry of Mines uh, on that, but just to Two points need to be mentioned. Uh, the new mining law will make it, of course, a lot easier for uh, international investors and others to enter the uh, min uh, mining sector of Afghanistan or extractive industry sector uh, of Afghanistan. And basically, the two items that uh, merit noting is that Article 19-3 uh, says that the Minister of Mines and Petroleum may, based on justifiable reasons, grant both exploration license and exploitation license in a single bidding upon endorsement of the Commission. And that's a major improvement on the current mining law, which they were separate, exploration, exploitation. The other part is that the existing requirement of parliamentary approvals for any license valued in excess of $50 million has been eliminated. Next. Just a list of outlook uh, for the next few years. Our project, as I said, is scheduled to be there till April of 2017. So we are there for the long term and uh, you can see the, the list of we work very closely with the uh, Ministry of Mines with a new minister uh, uh, His Excellency Mohammed Akbar Barakzai and Dion Harris uh, who is present here and uh, they have approved our programs we are working closely with with them uh, and we look forward to a successful accomplishment of the program i have i have here with me one page fact sheet on the program anyone who is interested i leave it here on the table after the the meeting you can after the our session you can uh, pick one also, I want to uh, say that I will be available uh, for one-on-one on one session this afternoon as well as tomorrow afternoon. Uh, with this, I'm going to introduce uh, our distinguished panel, panel members. Uh, the first speaker, Mr. Abdul Mubin Shahab, my colleague, my friend from Kabul who is the director of National Regional Resource Corridors uh, as, part, as part of the Ministry of Mines and Petroleum. And he's going to talk about how the Ministry of Mines and Petroleum is promoting private sector engagement and investment. Mr. Shah, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Michael. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, well, uh, uh, I have been asked to speak about the program that I am responsible for, and also the uh, activities of the program on how we can help to promote the private sector and attract uh, foreign investment. Well, I don't... Mm, go into much details uh, to the presentation. Uh, just uh, I would like to give a quick introduction to the program. The uh, National Regional Resource Corridor Program, it is uh, uh, a World Bank program. Uh, 
and this program is uh, uh, focusing on four uh, uh, aspects or dimensions. The objective of the program is uh, to facilitate the feasible grounds uh, for the economic development uh, of Afghanistan and to pave the way for a long-term economic sustainability of Afghanistan and uh, from, the, uh, extra, uh, from the utilization of extractive industry sector. Uh, can you please go to the next slide? The other slide? Yeah. Uh, uh, the NRRCP, National Regional Resource Corridor Program, it is uh, uh, one of the national priority programs of the Afghan government. As you are well aware that uh, in 2008, uh, for the first time, the Afghan government decided to have a, a bunch of uh, development programs you know, on different fields. One of them is the ID cluster under which the National and Regional Resource Corridors Program uh, operates. Uh, the project uh, has uh, four dimensions. Can you please go to the, yeah, the next one. The, the first component of the project, it is uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, the project focuses on uh, uh, infrastructure development uh, and uh, facilitation of uh, infrastructure possibilities uh, from the extractive industry, which includes uh, uh, building roads, railway. Uh, we have so far uh, uh, conducted several studies and analytical diagnostic uh, surveys on how we can uh, connect uh, uh, the, um, uh, the mineral resources to each other by facilitating the infrastructure projects. Uh, the second component of the project, it is uh, 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 livelihood. Under uh, livelihood, uh, the project focuses on skills development and uh, on uh, private sector development. Uh, uh, as you better understand that uh, one of the major challenges uh, that currently the Afghanistan private sector faces uh, uh, in the extractive uh, sector, that is lack of the uh, desired uh, technical uh, capacity of the local businesses uh, uh, in order to achieve uh, uh, and in order to, uh, to uh, enable the uh, local uh, pr uh, private sector, the project uh, uh, has uh, envisioned for uh, capacity building programs uh, the project has uh, uh, already facilitated uh, several uh, uh, long-term and short-term capacity building programs for the local <laughs> private enterprises uh, in order to, uh, to enable the capacity of the local private sector uh, to be able to uh, take more involvements and more part in the uh, extractive sector and as well as uh, the other challenge in the extractive industry, that is the lack of the uh, uh, desired skills. Uh, the program also focuses on skills development. Uh, the program works with the uh, local businesses on how they can uh, build the required capacities of the uh, local businesses in order to be able uh, uh, to, uh, to get more involvement in the uh, uh, extractive and mining uh, industry. Uh, the other uh, aspect of the program, uh, it is uh, a very important aspect uh, that is uh, social and environmental uh, aspect of the, uh, uh, in the extractive sector. As you understand, uh, in the contemporary history of Afghanistan, uh, we are for the first time experimenting the extraction and developing of the mineral resources by the private sector. And uh, in this way, when the private sector moves for exploration and ex uh, extraction of the mineral resources, uh, uh, a very important issue of, for consideration is the environmental and protection. So the program focuses on uh, uh, building the capacity of the companies uh, and uh, preparing uh, different uh, uh, analytical uh, works uh, on how we can be more protective uh, 
uh, in order to move uh, in the extractive and extraction. Uh, the project uh, has so far uh, succeeded uh, to uh, prepare different uh, assessment programs, uh, uh, social environmental assessment programs and social environmental risks program from the extractive point of view. Uh, the other aspect of the project uh, uh, which is also a very important aspect, that is the, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, outreach. One of the major uh, uh, problems that we have so far uh, evaluated, it is the lack of uh, enough outreach uh, uh, from the ministries uh, to the local businesses and international uh, uh, investors community. So the project uh, also works uh, in order to find uh, uh, feasible ways uh, on how we can uh, uh, share information on how we can uh, uh, build uh, uh, active dialogue between the public and private on how we can facilitate the investment climate for the, uh, uh, for, uh, how we can facilitate the, uh, and enabling in investment climate in which the interested investors could be capable and could be having the possibilities uh, to take advantage of the opportunities uh, in the mining and extractive sector. Uh, uh, this uh, pro program works within uh, uh, the Ministry of Mines and Petroleum. However, uh, the program has a broader dimension. Uh, one of the other dimension of the program uh, is uh, within the infrastructure cluster, which works with the Ministry of Public Work of Afghanistan. Uh, so uh, 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 some of the achievements uh, that we have so far uh, done on the private sector development and foreign inv investment facilitations. Uh, we have uh, concluded studies on different mechanisms and procedures on how we can uh, facilitate an, in, uh, an environment in which uh, we can uh, uh, pave the way for public-private uh, partnerships. We are working also on with other uh, counterparts uh, for uh, uh, finding a regulatory framework for the public-private partnership and also uh, for find, uh, finding a, a, uh, an uh, environment so that the private sector could uh, take more involvement into the uh, mining uh, opportunities uh, through the independent uh, uh, approaches like in the infrastructure, independent power plants and others. Uh, the, 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 uh, the final uh, uh, part of the program is uh, that the program works uh, closely with the uh, major contractors of the Ministry of Mines and Petroleum on considering the local content while they are having business opportunities, while they are requiring for uh, local uh, contents. So, so we have worked with the uh, uh, CNPCIW, which is the major contractor for the Amudaria oil uh, mine and also I have worked uh, with the MCC for INAC uh, authority uh, on the mechanism on how we can get uh, more involvements of the local businesses in the uh, business opportunities they have and we have also achieved uh, to prepare uh, a guideline and a mechanism for a local content preference. Uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier that this, the project is fully financed by the World Bank uh, we are directly working under the Ministry of Mines and Petroleum. We have also concluded uh, uh, an RC strategy, uh, resource corridors strategy, which highlights uh, uh, the major and significant parts of resource corridor development, that is like infrastructure, in power, local content development, and uh, also on railway, and uh, uh, as well as on investment uh, uh, attraction. So that was uh, a brief description of the NRRCP National Regional Resource Corridors Program. Oh, and uh, I will be available if you have further questions. Uh, and uh, uh, I thank the Afghan American Chamber of Commerce and the Afghanistan Chamber of Commerce and Industries uh, for organizing this significant event. Uh, this is a real uh, f uh, 
of uh, possibility for us and for the uh, inter, uh, for the foreign investors uh, to come and take advantage of opportunities in Afghanistan. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Shahab Mobin John. Uh, great presentation. The next presenter, uh, I have to uh, mention that please note that everyone's bio is included, all the speakers' bio are included in the uh, conference packet that you have. So I'm not going to take time of the conference to go through their bios. They are all distinguished uh, scholars, uh, people uh, who have worked in their field, and they all are, have uh, been involved in the mineral industry of, of uh, or extractive industry, I should say, of Afghanistan. So our next speaker is Mr. Esmatullah Golestani. He's a chief operations officer of Marble Center of Excellence in Afghanistan. And he's going to talk about building the marble industry in Afghanistan. Good afternoon. I want to thank uh, the ACC for providing us the opportunity for providing the Afghanistan Marble Industry uh, Center of Excellence the opportunity to uh, represent Afghanistan Marble Industry and to allow us to talk about Afghanistan Marble sector. I would like to start it this way to say that um, I've heard uh, a speech of His Excellency Deputy Minister uh, Jamal Harris, but I didn't hear any word about marble industry. I just want to say that uh, investing in the, uh, let's say, gas sector or fuel sector would require a huge investment. Um, see, short compar comparison of investing in the marble industry and in, in, uh, the other sectors, which is in the mining uh, industry. Uh, well, you could, you could extract, you could do big business with a, with a very small amount of money in the marble industry. Let it put it, put it this way. So how much of an investment would you need to extract one ton of natural gas? But let me tell you that uh, extracting a ton of stone or dimension of stone would cost you very, very little comparing um, gas or fuel. And then how much would you sell a ton of gas or oil in the market? $500, $600. I'm just telling you that I facilitate, or the Marvel Industry Center of Excellence facilitated a, a deal with uh, in the European market, but we sold the stone in Afghanistan, $1,400 per ton. That's onyx, uh, I would say. And marble is uh, 600 to 700 per ton. Uh, you would just require to invest a couple of hundred thousand dollars to buy a diamond wire saw or a chainsaw and go on a mountain. It's a mountain. You are not required or you're not necessarily needed to deep 100 meters or 1,000 meters you know, drill in the, in the ground and extract a ton of gas or oil, but you're working on a mountain, you extract a stone, and then you easily sell it in the market. Um, we sold stone, which is not cat. Naturally, you take it from a mountain, and we sold it 1000 or $1,400 per ton. So I see very, or a lot of familiar faces here from Kabul, from Afghanistan, they invested or they're working in different fields and they've invested a lot of money. I'm just saying that I, I want to invite you to invite me to your offices so that we can talk about this in Afghanistan, in Kabul, and we will help you or we will advise you how to do the business in the marble industry. So uh, welcome to the marble industry. Uh, well, the uh, initial uh, benefit of uh, uh, marble industry was founded after the OTF report or the and the USGS report was published in 2007 in, in Afghanistan and then 
that kind of convinced the local investors to uh, go explore mountains in Afghanistan. I mean, I'm talking about marble or uh, other dimension stone and, uh, reserved. Um, we've got a lot of them in Afghanistan. So um, they started with very basic uh, type of equipment um, and very limited uh, amount of money in the sector, um, using explosives, blasting the quarries, but still had the courage to do the job and, and, and let the others or convince others to come and invest in the, in the industry and, uh, and promote the industry. They, uh, they did a great job. Um, so, and then after OTF published the report and the US and GS published the report, um, ASMED came over and took over and then uh, studying that report, tried to implement a project to support, with a limited amount of uh, fans, support the marble industry, uh, get, you know, granted or given away equipment, uh, some pieces of equipment to around the country to the uh, members in the industry. Um, that helped actually the industry promote a bit. Um, we kind of uh, then, uh, that was kind of given fish to the people um, but uh, it, it still, there was problem of uh, using of the uh, those equipment. That's to give fish, but uh, you know you have to show people how to fish. But uh, then, okay, I'm not take a chart. When when Asmut closed, uh, and there was a halt in the uh, marble supporting or promoting marble industry in Afghanistan. So. Um, the DOC, Department of Commerce, then, uh, awarded a project, actually uh, flagging the national wind project to implement a pro uh, this uh, center of excellence to support marble industry in Afghanistan. And the scope of the project is um, training uh, marble industry members in coring and to uh, train uh, the members in the processing plants, how to process the stone and to uh, export, uh, plus trade shows. Uh, we're sending Afghan trade members in the marble industry uh, overseas or to the international trade shows to see standards and to, to learn standards how to uh, process the stone, how to extract or square blocks or you know rectangle blocks and then send it to Europe or the US or international market. Um, right then um, uh, we've got we've got yeah we've got trainings uh, you know s so far six process uh, core trainings we've trained 135 uh, industry members including uh, owners, supervisors, managers and laborers and we've got uh, seven uh, process training uh, that we have uh, actually trained to uh, about 200 people in the processor uh, industry, um, uh, marble industry, and we've got uh, people attended actually trade shows overseas. Uh, uh, two of them so far in Izmir, A uh, Turkey, and uh, Verona, Italy, and uh, also we have uh, facilitated the purchasing uh, blocks or stone by international uh, trade members or, or uh, yeah, trade members in Afghanistan. That's the first time we did it uh, for the for the Afghan tr uh, trade members, um, and um, we also organized or reorganized some processing plants on the ground in Afghanistan, and uh, helped uh, supervise some of the quarries. Uh, to make them work or extract uh, blocks or stone according to the world uh, standards. I'm just quickly going on the opportunities and challenges. Opportunities in Afghanistan, I just saw the presentation on the new Kabul city. I'm just saying that uh, there's a huge, that, that's a potential market for, a domestic market for marble industry, so you could, you could Produce as as much of as many of blocks or stone to send it to New Kabul or or a lot of construction projects in, in, in Afghanistan going on. 
I know there are challenges as well, including security, um, extortion, and, uh, and other problem, uh, financial problems. Uh, but I'm saying that there's a huge demand internationally for Afghanistan stone. Uh, looking at the quality of a stone, Afghanistan and so on, and the beautiful color that they have. So, um, yeah, they, they, are, they are great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Golestani. Here, yes, Matt John. Uh, our next speaker is Captain Scott Bishop. I have to correct in the program, uh, it was, uh, uh, was a mistype that U.S. Army, no, he's uh, uh, U.S. Navy. U.S. Navy Captain Scott Bishop, Bishop who is uh, in charge of natural resource development of DOD, Department of Defense Task Force on Business Stability on, and Operations in Afghanistan. Uh, Scott is going to talk about progress in tendering large mineral and petroleum leases in Afghanistan. Scott. Thank you, Dr. Hardari. It's great to see so many familiar faces, especially from Kabul. Uh, uh, Your Excellency, Deputy Mr. Harris, good to see you, sir. Um, Mr. Ritter, and uh, to the, all of the Afghan American uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, thank you for putting on such a uh, quality event. Um, I know my organization uh, is happy to be here, and in fact, uh, we've kind of pulled two different directions because we also have a, a large uh, conference in London, uh, Minds and Money London, going on right now where we're uh, promoting uh, Afghanistan and uh, private sector investment. So uh, thank you for having us. Uh, again, uh, my name is Scott Bischoff. Yes, I'm Navy. What, what am I doing in Afghanistan? I'm not sure yet, but I've been there for about a year and a half and uh, enjoyed every single day of it. Uh, it's been very rewarding. Uh, as well as challenging, of course. Uh, I'm not going to give a big background on uh, the Task Force for Business and Stability Operations because my boss is here and he's up next, and uh, uh, it's bad form to uh, steal, his, uh, steal his thunder. So uh, I'm going to focus on uh, my little sliver of uh, what we call TFBSO, and uh, that's the minerals uh, piece of it. Um, we uh, have an office here in Crystal City. We don't like to be here very much. We like to be in Kabul, and that's where most of my team spends their uh, days and weeks and months. Uh, the reason they're there, so that they can be in the office, in the ministry, hand in hand with uh, Deputy Minister Harris's uh, staff, Deputy Minister Durrani's staff, uh, and of course, His Excellency uh, Minister uh, Barakzai. Uh, the, the main thrust of our work, and we are laser focused on bringing the private sector to Afghanistan, uh, we firmly believe that the private sector is the key to future stability in the region. So from my perspective as the minerals team lead, we know how rich the country is geologically. We know we've had collisions, plates, ocean closures. The Soviets did uh, yeoman's work collecting a lot of data. So my job as the uh, minerals team lead is to connect that data, that information with the private sector and help facilitate the, uh, the regulatory uh, environment, legal environment to, uh, to bring those two together and get, to get that investment moving. Uh, Dr. Hidari said we'd give a, uh, an update on the uh, our current tender efforts uh, in Kabul. Uh, we've, had a, we've had a pretty good year. Uh, currently we have four uh, large-scale mineral tenders that are uh, this close to, uh, to being contracts being signed. Uh, we're waiting on a few ministers to, to, to fill in uh, some empty positions, but uh, once the IMC convenes here shortly, we expect signatures on contracts for four large-scale exploration um, projects, uh, Badakhshan, Balkhab, Shaida, and, uh, and Zarkashan down in uh, Ghazni province. Um, beyond that, our partnership uh, with, uh, close partnership with USGS and the, uh, the private sector has enabled us to build uh, enough reports to hand off uh, to the ministry uh, beyond 2013-14 uh, and, uh, and continue that tender process. And again, I understand uh, in Midas and the, the USAID uh, folks will be there uh, as well. 
Um, beyond minerals or beyond the metals, uh, the, these tenders that we're talking about are uh, copper and gold uh, right now. Beyond that, there's a lot of, uh, we, we see a lot of great uh, opportunity for the private sector, uh, especially in cement. And in fact, we just closed the uh, expression of interest uh, window uh, for our first three, or the ministry's uh, first three cement tenders. Uh, one in uh, Jubal Saraj, just north of Kabul, one across the Saline Pass in Pule Kumre to, s to supply cement to the north, and then one out in Harat. And we, we, we did receive quite a bit of interest, and that, uh, that tender process is, uh, is starting to roll uh, at this time. Uh, that is the, uh, the main thrust of our work. We are doing a little bit of capacity development at the ministry, although that's not our, our mission. Uh, we do see some uh, need for it to help with the tender process. We've done some at the uh, Afghan Geologic Survey as well, uh, with the start of some uh, exploratory drilling uh, on that front. But uh, getting these tenders through, uh, getting that law that Dr. Haidari talked about, uh, uh, I wouldn't say fixed, but uh, progressing, uh, and that new law that links that exploitation uh, with the exploration will, uh, will greatly help uh, the, the efforts and greatly uh, enhance the, uh, the revenue and the job creation in, uh, in Afghanistan. Our experts tell us that uh, in a developing nation, for every miner that uh, you employ, you can expect up to 10 additional jobs supporting that miner. So uh, very compelling argument to keep mining on the forefront as a, uh, as a foundational industry uh, for a growing nation. And uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, yeah, as Scott said, uh, TFPSO has been quite active in Afghanistan in the uh, extractive industry sector, and uh, I need to mention the other gentleman uh, with TFPSO who is not here, Ryan Iyer and Scott, and our program, they've been, U USAID Midas have been working together, and our program, as Scott said, are complementary, and uh, of course, they work under the leadership of Jim Bullion, and uh, we appreciate our, our work together. So that's uh, it's been very good. Our next speaker, I am uh, delighted to introduce Saeed Mirzad, who is the coordinator of Afghanistan program with U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, some people might say that Saeed is the the father of geology in Afghanistan. And uh, I am uh, honored to say that, uh, you know, we worked together before at U.S. Geological Survey and when I was with U.S. Bureau of Mines here in Washington and USGS, and uh, I have high esteem for him. And uh, Saeed is going to talk about the role of USGS in developing the mining sector in Afghanistan. Thank you, Dr. Ardery. Thank you, ACC and Don, for inviting me. This time I come without a PowerPoint, empty pocket. Often, you know, there are several years that uh, we uh, discussed this matter, we said that the problem of Afghanistan is poverty and joblessness. Now we are proud of having sent to schools 8 million students. It means what they will do when they are getting out of school. Are they going to uh, shovel, uh, go back home and shovel uh, the dirt with their uh, father? Of course not. What they want, they want job, quality jobs. Now, what are the resources? Agriculture or something else? Mining. Agriculture feeds a country. But it doesn't create, you know, the kind of uh, uh, quality jobs for millions of people. So we went toward mining. I knew I was the director of Afghan Geological Survey, and I spent more than half a century in the mountains of Afghanistan. There's no place in Afghanistan I didn't work. I didn't do geology. I knew that Afghanistan uh, was rich. But what's impo important is to put it in a kind of frame that is palatable by the business people, by investors. And for that, we had to do some extra work, some, some work. 
You know, we at the USGS, we are, we are scientists. We don't have money. But what we need, and we had those people, visionary people that understood the importance of what we are doing and financed us. At the beginning, that was USSD, then the, the USAID, then uh, they dropped it out, and then we had the help of the task force, which was very effective, and we did all of the things that we are talking about. And we all also said that the investors, they are intelligent people. Of course, if they were not, they could not be investors. Need three things. One is the data information, the second rule of the game, and the third security. Now, we worked a lot on data uh, information. We did geological map, we did topographical map, we did airborne geophysics, hyperspectral magnetic gravity. I don't want you know to, to blur your, your brain with all this technical word. But Afghanistan today is covered by data and information more than any country around this. In some respect, Afghanistan is even ahead of the United States. Airborne geophysics had been done in the United States but 200 kilometers, square kilometers, 500 square kilometers, but not the coverage of the whole country. Afghanistan had been covered by hyperspectral and other geophysics, uh, uh, airborne geophysics, the whole country, except the border of Afghanistan. All of that permitted us, with the help of the, the task force, uh, to to create data packages. In data packages, this is the thing that the investor can see. And now the investor in Afghanistan is at the level to decide, am I going to do this or not? Instead of going in the dark, nobody, no investor will go and, and put 20, 30 million dollars you know, in Afghanistan to see if there is something or not. And Beside that, there is no mines if there is no water. We did hydrology in areas that we worked. The most important of all that is not well understood is the capacity building. You know, the international community failed miserably in terms of capacity building. We had people going for 15 days, you know, organizing classes, you know, uh, uh, cakes and, and uh, cookies, you know, at 10 o'clock and at 4 o'clock, thing like that. And when that was finished, bye-bye. And some of those trainees ended up in a workshop, in a, in a, uh, uh, working with some engines or something like that. You know, we have to coordinate that. It should be followed up. We should check, you know, that should be on the job training and follow that year by year to see where they are. Now, what is the conclusion of everything? If you are interested in detail of the work that we have done, I'm ready, I'm at your disposal. But what is the conclusion is that Afghans in the world know that Afghanistan is a rich country. It is not a piece of dry rock, a futureless country. I believe that Afghanistan will be one of the richest country around, especially its position of uh, in, in geography. Another thing that uh, we discovered and we proposed in uh, the work that we have done, we have found interesting deposit in the border of Pakistan, Afghanistan. That could be exploited and, ex uh, and explored and exploited by both countries. And the main problem between Afghanistan and Pakistan is that there is no solid economic relationship between the, these two countries. Now, dangerous things you know, for mining. Number one is the law. If the law is not palatable to investors, 
and there are glitches in the laws, then nobody will come. And His Excellency, the Vice Minister, said so. And I know that the Ministry of Mind did this work. But the main work stays there to convince the parliaments that this is a good thing to do. Instead of thinking that all the foreigners are coming and getting you know, the, our riches out of Afghanistan, we should understand that any company, anywhere in the world, they will spend 50% of their income inside the country. 50, even more than 50%. So look, all these companies spending half of their uh, earning inside Afghanistan. Thank you. Now, the other danger is the investors themselves. Avoid investors that bid for some uh, project and keep it next to their chest for a possible resale. Keep it five, six, seven years, and then make sure that they put some money in producing things. Now, the other danger is archaeology. You know that the, the, the uh, 24 areas and 37 uh, uh, sub-areas, I visited all of them. We found those areas interesting. I have two more minutes. Um, well, I, I forgot what I wanted to say. <laughs> yes. It should not impede mining. It should work with mining. I'm sure that in these deposits, that we, this is how we found them. There's a lot of archaeological things. In each one of this, then if you are not seriously uh, uh, tackling you know, this question of archaeology and mining, then it will impede you know, mining in Afghanistan. And the last danger is, Mr. Vice Minister, the environment. Mining is a dirty job. If you are not taking care of the environment right now, that will be too late in one year. Finally, Mr. Vice Minister and your colleague from the Ministry of Mine, listen to our nice words, but keep our feet on fire to produce systematic and reliable data and information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saeed, for all your, among others, uh, words of wisdom also. Thank you. Uh, our last speaker is Benjamin Phelan. He is the Director of Innovation and Technology as f at Future Brilliance. Future Brilliance FB is the an NGO that has been active in Afghanistan, in, uh, especially in gemstone industry. And uh, he's going to talk about gemstones and jewelry, untapped potential. Ben? Thank you very much, and thanks to all of the other speakers today. Some very interesting information. Future Brilliance is dedicated to unlocking the inherent natural brilliance of the Afghan people. And we wanted to start with gemstones and jewelry because of the immense untapped potential of this particular sector. Uh, you're all aware of the USGS survey, and uh, I don't know if we have a, the PowerPoint here, but in any event, um, there's a great deal of mineral wealth, of course, in Afghanistan to be unlocked. And as the legislation continues to go through for regulation, uh, we can go to the next slide. This, uh, this wealth will play a key role in revitalizing the Afghan economy and the nation. Um, but vocational training is going to be a key component of that because although the value of these mineral resources is extremely high in their rough form, it's much higher in a finished form. When it's cut, when it's put into jewelry, when it's delivered to markets, there's a multiplier that takes place when all those skill sets come into place. So there are two kinds of resources I'll be talking about today. Not only the natural resources, the fundamental materials that go into creating these items, but the human resources that add value to them by a, a large multiple. Next slide, please. 
So the issue right now is that a lot of what's happening in Afghanistan around these particular mineral sources um, is artisanal mining, which still uses destructive and outdated techniques that can be updated and improved. Um, also, the, of course, the stones are being exported almost entirely in the rough form rather than cut and set there. And the loss in the value chain needs to be filled in by vocational training. Next slide, please. So in essence, what we're interested in looking at is how can we bring a, a high level of skills at an internationally certifiable level um, into the country, continue to develop those sets in the population so that these uh, resources can be realize their full potential. Next slide. And in addition to that, we want to not just look at closing the skills gap, but also, if possible, jumping ahead into uh, an even more advanced way of looking at how these can be brought together. For, for the past year or so, um, Future Brilliance has been under a grant from the Task Force for Business and Stability Operations. Thank you to, uh, to Jim as well for that. Um, we've been training students in India, actually, at the Indian Institute of Gemstones and Jewelry. Um, and we're working with an organization in the UK called Cities and Guilds to give them international certification in gemology, gemstone cutting, jewelry design, et, <coughs> et cetera. Um, and in addition to that, we're establishing a collective of, of men and women artisans in Afghanistan that will be able to come together and create a uh, product for market and bring it to international markets through 21st century technologies. We're equipping them with, with tablets that are solar powered and the ability to create e-commerce websites, to connect with consumers outside of the country in the West and in Europe um, so that they can take mobile money payments, they can send their goods uh, via international shipping, and they can take advantage of the huge explosion that we've seen all throughout the West and in China now for uh, direct sales and for internet-based commerce. Next slide, please. What's really needed ultimately in our view is an advanced training and production center in the country where people can learn on the ground uh, so we don't necessarily have to take people out of country for those advanced skill sets. Um, they can have a facility where they'll actually be able to certify gemstones, <coughs> establish their value in the country, do everything that needs to be done to take product to the international marketplace in its finished form and to produce it entirely in country. That's our ambition um, at Future Brilliance. Next slide, please. Um, and before I go to this one, actually, uh, we are introducing a new brand, and I'd like to just roll a, a brief video that describes a bit about the Afghan-made brand that we're going to be bringing now to the West this year. And as you're watching this video, remember, Christmas is on its way. Afghanistan, the crossroads of civilizations. With a unique history of art, that permeates Afghan craftsmanship today. Afghanistan is extraordinarily rich in gemstones, tourmaline, emeralds, and amethyst, kunzite, beautiful spinels from Jagdalak, lapis lazuli from Badakhshan. And not only rich in gemstones, but rich in designs. And that gives an extraordinary richness to the range of products and designs that we can make. Working with Future Brilliance in Jaipur, India, Young Afghan artisans are trained in the most up-to-date techniques to marry tradition with modern manufacturing. It's been pretty marvelous because the students have been really enthusiastic, very talented, really wanting to learn as much as possible. I've sat down with a number of them on the designs themselves and they have been so dedicated, so focused, so really wanting to make this happen. For me, that's been fantastic. The Afghan craft industry has the potential to be a really significant driver of economic growth in this country. We think as well it can also help forge an idea of national identity and, and, and pride in that identity. Proud to be Afghan and proud to be a modern Afghan in an increasingly globalized world. From the deepest, most vibrant blues of lapis lazuli to the purest gold, Afghan made products by the skill and passion of countless generations. Ayenda, introducing jewelry from Afghanistan. And thank you. 
Thank you very much. And back to the last PowerPoint slide, if you can. Uh, so you saw a few of the items that are in the Ainda collection. These items are uh, designed by Afghan craftspeople in collaboration with celebrated Western designers. Um, they're being manufactured with those craftspeople and some finishing in other locations. And uh, you can see some of the other items from the collection here on this last slide as well. Um, we urge you to, to visit our, our Shopify website, Ayanda Jewelry, at uh, myshopify.com. But you can, uh, you can investigate what we're doing, and also maybe you can do some early Christmas shopping if you haven't finished on that as well. Thanks so much for your time. Michael, thank you for being a great moderator, and thank you, panel, for being a terrific panel. Uh, really appreciate it, and it gives us, as you so well summarized, a very good idea of, of uh, the latest and greatest in the industry, including uh, minister, Deputy Minister's presentation. So thank you all.